It was only 165 years ago that people established the connection between dirty drinking water and killer diseases such as cholera and typhoid. In the growing industrial city of Nottingham in central England, the need for clean water increased. To supply the demand, the corporation expanded the existing covered reservoir at Papplewick, north of the city, built by Thomas Hawksley, public water pioneer, by sinking two new wells. By 1883, Marriott Ogle Tarbotton, gas and water company chief engineer, had installed five Lancashire boilers to power the boring machinery, then later steam pumps. He erected an ornate pumping house to contain two James Watt and Company steam-powered beam engines. Inside the pump house, a riot of ornate decoration goes hand in hand with utility. Stained glass windows, ornamented pillars topped by cranes, well-known waterfowl, lend a cathedral-like air to proceedings. The nodding beams, like massive mechanical monks at prayer, quietly rock without cease. They unlock the power of coal, so plentiful in this region, into raising water from the filter rocks below to the underground reservoir, ready to be supplied to the people and industry of the city. James Watt's company supplied the engines in 1884, the most modern that money could buy. These double-action piston machines were a world away from that 1750 kettle lid blowing off. Watt improved steam power by his ingenious use of expanding and contracting gases, as well as the mechanical linkages and valve gear. Although Watt died in 1819, his pioneering work was carried on at the Bolton and Watt factory in Birmingham. One of the innovations we can see today is the Watt parallel motion. The piston and its connecting rod are vertical, but the beam above traces an arc. If the piston rod were connected to the beam, it would bend with the rise and fall. The parallel motion prevents this by a four-bar linkage, whose lengths and angles are designed to transmit the linear motion from the piston to the circular motion of the beam. From the first day, engineers measured everything about the operation, from the quantity of water pumped and the amount of coal used to every pump of the engine. This beam counter, worked by a pendulum inside the box, counts every stroke. City administrators, when not drinking tea or playing golf, could calculate the efficiency of the operation, no doubt demanding cost-cutting measures to ensure money for the corporate merrymaking. Another James Watt innovation is the double action. Steam pushes one side of the piston, whilst condensed gases pull the other side. This means every stroke gives power. 
Whilst all this pushing and pulling goes on to rock the beam, the other end operates the pump below ground to raise the water. This also provided pressure to keep the boilers topped up. In the boiler house, things are becoming perilous. When four boilers are working as designed, the draft from the chimney is enough to take out the smoke. Today, with only one boiler, an electric fan helps out. This is what happens during a power cut. William Fairburn's Lancashire boilers heat from the front. The hot gas goes along tubes inside. The heat then comes forward along the outside before going back along the bottom towards the chimney. This heats the water evenly. The boilers have inspection plates so men can go inside, as well as low water alarms, safety valves and stop valves for the steam takeoff. An arrangement of pierced collector pipes and baffles inside the boiler stop water entering the steam feed to the engines. Every piece of the around two tons of coal per day needed to keep this boiler alive arrives by human muscle power. That's around 200 kilowatts of energy going off in there. The balance between water and steam space in the boiler is critical for efficiency. This indicator shows the correct level. Another exhibit, although never operated on this site, is the coal mine winding engine from the nearby Linby Colliery. This was used to transport coal and miners from the deep workings to the surface. It lifted around nine tons at a time. It was built by Roby of Lincoln in 1922 and worked until 1982. This is the only steam winding engine still in operation in Britain. Not only does the engine have to be strong, but also it has to have powerful brakes to hold the load in position in the shaft. As well as the steaming engines, today was a celebration of all things 1940. Vehicles and fashions were on display, and just as it was at the time, the Second World War is ever-present. And not everyone was on the winning side. Vater Unser, da du bist in Himmel, dein Name würde geheilig. Dein Reich komme, dein Wille geschehe, wie in Himmel, also auf Erden. 
unser tägliches Brot, gib uns heute und vergeben unsere Schuld. Wie wir vergeben uns so Schuldigen, denn dein ist das Reich und deine Kraft und deine Ehrlichkeit in Ehrlichkeit. Amen. Late as ever, the Americans arrive, overpaid, oversexed, and over here. This Willys Jeep was the first mass-produced four-wheel drive car, specified by the American Army, but built by several manufacturers under license. It is kitted out as a forward communications vehicle complete with shortwave radio equipment. This example from 1965 was made by Hotchkiss Brandt in Paris, but differs little from the wartime spec. People came in period costume, ready to reenact a time when Britain was great, upper lips were stiff, and a chap wasn't properly dressed without a tie and a hat. Although by 1940 most homes had electricity, portable generators were still common. These small motors provide noise and fumes in the quest for those elusive volts. No 40s pageant would be complete without a battle. Here, safely across the lake, the plucky Brits are overwhelmed by the Teutonic efficiency of the German war machine, but not before lots of bangs and flashes.